Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unisor Education. We continue talking about transformation of certain types of energy into electricity, and in this case, in this lecture, we will talk about transformation of solar energy um, into electricity. Um, the way how it's done is very different from the previous um, explanations of how, for instance, um, kinetic energy is transformed into electricity or uh, chemical energy. So it's different and what's important is that in case of Sun the energy of Sun is free and if we are able to convert it into electricity well, great, free energy. Well, it's not simple but it is possible and that's where the solar panels are coming from uh, now, this lecture will not be about technical details of how solar panels are, are actually made. Um, it's more about the principles of the functionality of the solar panels. These are purely theoretical principles and they are related to semiconductors. Uh, so, I will have to talk about how semiconductors working. So, basically, again, this is not a technical lecture, it's a theoretical lecture. Um, and I think it's very interesting and uh, it's very important to understand, actually, what are the basic principles behind generation of electricity from sunlight. This lecture is part of the course. The course is called Physics for Teens. It's presented on unisor.com. If you found this lecture on Unisor or anywhere else, on sorry on on YouTube or anywhere else, uh, I suggest you to use rather the website unisor.com, which links to um, YouTube lecture, um, because every lecture on Unisor has textual notes, which are basically like a textbook. So it's you know very useful not only to listen but also to read exactly the same thing, well almost exactly the same thing. Um, and there are some nice pictures, which probably are much better than whatever I will try to uh, to picture here. Um, maybe some more detailed uh, formulas or something else. Plus, the website contains exams uh, for those who are interested in challenging themselves. Um, and uh, and the website is completely free. Unisor has no advertising or anything else. Access is completely free no uh, strings attached. Okay, so let's talk about uh, solar panels. Now, the main component of the solar panel is silicon. This is chemical formula for silicon. Now, what is silicon? It's an element. By the way, don't mix silicon and silicon with E letter at the end. This is an element, an elementary element um, which occurs in, in nature. The silicon with E is basically an, an artificially made um, uh, chemical compound with silicon as a component, but it's a completely different thing. So we're not talking about silicon with E, we are talking about silicon like this one, okay? And the chemical formula is Si. Well, um, it's interesting that silicon is probably one of the most um, frequently occurring element uh, on Earth. Basically, it's part of the silica and it's basically sand. So, um, there is a lot of silicon which we can actually use. So this is the main component of a uh, solar battery. Now, um, what's important about silicon is it's not a metal, but it's not a dielectric either, so it doesn't conduct electricity as well as metals, but it doesn't really serve as a dielectric, which means completely inactive uh, electrically. It's in between. Well, that's why it's called semiconductor, and that's why silicon is the main component in 
all the electronics which we have. It's all based on the principle of semiconductivity, which I'm going to explain right now in some details. More details probably will be in a separate lecture about semiconductors. This is an application of semiconductors to solar energy usage. So, um, structure of the atom of silicon is, it has 14 protons, certain number of neutrons, we are not talking about neutrons because we are interested only in electrical component, and around this you have 14 electrons. But 14 electrons are not on the same orbit, they are actually on three orbits. One, two, and three. You have two electrons here, you have eight electrons here, and you have four electrons here. So the most, the outermost orbit, which is actually the orbit where so-called valence electrons are located, those which are related to chemical um, and uh, other bonds with atom, with other atoms, it has only four. Now, um, on the website, I do have a picture of the structure of the um, crystalline, crystalline structure of, uh, of silicon. You see, these are four electrons. So there are four uh, connections, and other atoms also, uh, also have four um, electrons on their outermost orbits. And electrons are actually connected, it's called covalent uh, bond. So when many atoms are present, are present, they are connected through these covalent bonds. And I will depict it as this. We have four electrons. Each one has four electrons. So that would be my flat representation of uh, the structure of um, of the crystal, um, crystalline structure of uh, uh, silicon. In reality, it's supposed to be a three-dimensional, three-dimensional, and uh, that's why I'm actually referring you to unisor.com, where the notes for this same lecture contain a nice picture. Um, the idea is, if you consider a tetrahedron which is basically like a triangle and this triangle, like a pyramid, okay? So in the center you have atom, and in four other angles you have atoms. And that's how this represent, represents a three-dimensional structure of the crystalline silicon. But on the flat surface, I will just, for completely edu educational purposes, I will depict it as this. So each atom has four connections. So, this is the inner structure of the crystalline uh, silicon. So, every crystal has a, a three-dimensional structure which I will represent on the flat surface as, as, as this. And four connections means that each atom has four balance electrons and they are uh, connected um, among themselves, these uh, electrons on the outermost orbits. Um, they are connected into covalent uh, bonds and that's what make, makes the crystal. These covalent bonds are rather strong um, considering we are talking about electrons on the outermost orbits um, probably their relationship between the atoms, I mean between the electrons which are actually making these covalent bonds, is probably stronger than the relationship with the protons inside the nuclei. Um, so, again, the existence of these covalent bonds is very, very important for the whole uh, semiconductor industry, if you wish. Now, these atoms are neutral because the number of protons is 14 and the number of electrons is also 14. Two on inner, uh, eight on middle, and four on outer orbit. Okay, so it's neutral, 
which means if you will just you know connect if you will try to to to, to uh, measure its resistance so you put some kind of probe um, with some voltage and you will try to measure the electricity the current you will not see much um, primarily because it's not a metal so these electrons are really kind of um, strongly connected uh, to each other they're not like really free electrons I mean they're relatively free but not as free as in the metals uh, so basically you will not see a lot of conductivity um, on the other hand if you will heat it uh, which means you will excite electrons more obviously right the heat energy is transferred into kinetic energy of the electrons they will be a little bit more uh, inclined to leave their place and go somewhere else so the resistance would be diminishing um, and the conductivity will be increasing of these semiconductors with increase of the temperature or any other form of exciting like for instance sunlight sunlight also excites electrons right it's energy well it's basically heat in some way or another and that would be actually the principle but again right now if you will just measure resistance it would be very high even if you will you know um, in, in increase the temperature or, or sunlight it will increase a little bit the conductivity but it will not be a source of electricity obviously because it's completely neutral how can we make it a source of energy how can we make sunlight even if it just I, 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 even if we will heat it or, or put sunlight how can we make produce electricity and that's the next topic okay so the first thing which we do is we will slightly change this particular structure we will introduce some impurity some add-on how let's not talk about how but there is a way to replace atom of silicon with atom of let's say phosphorus the phosphorus chemical formula is p what's interesting about phosphorus phosphorus has five electrons on its outer orbit actually some other elements will will do as well so if it has five it has one more electron here so these are silica silica these are all silica and a little bit of phosphorus somewhere here here you might have another silica and another silica and then another phosphorus something like this so whenever we introduce certain amount of phosphorus inside the silicon I will have these electrons extra electrons which which are not bonded to anything so they're also on the outer orbit of atom which means they are well might be a little freer than the others but what's different between this free outer uh, uh, on, uh, electron on the outer orbit of phosphorus and these four electrons which are on the outer orbit of the silicon these are related to other atoms and they're bonded through covalent <coughs> excuse me covalent bonds this one doesn't have any covalent bonds so it's freer so to speak well what happens in this particular case well it's relatively free so you can just go somewhere um, where can it go well for instance it can go to another atom of silicon replace it in the covalent bond but that would free electron from silicon so in this particular case we will have certain number of electrons well as many electrons as many atoms of phosphorus are introduced right so we will have these electrons which are kind of floating around they might replace electrons in in silica which frees that electron which they have replaced and that one will go further and 
uh, all these wandering of electrons will definitely occur in the mixture of silicon and phosphorus. Why? Because phosphorus has one extra electron on its orbit. Now, the whole thing is still electrically neutral because phosphorus has one more proton, obviously, and one more electron. Um, so the whole thing is electrically neutral. However, it more resembles like metals, for instance, which are electrically neutral, but there are many electrons which are relatively free, those from the outer orbits. They are not exactly, you know, strongly connected to, to nuclei, and they can just jump to another atom, replace those el uh, electrons on the outer orbit, push them further, etc., etc. So this wandering of electrons occurs in this particular thing a little bit more like in, in the metals. Okay. Now, this thing is called N-type. N stands for negative, and negative because electrons are negative and we are having these floating, wandering electrons. Okay, let's consider a slightly different situation. Let's consider, instead of atom of phosphorus, we will add atoms of um, boron. Now, what's different here? Boron has three electrons on its outer orbit, less than four. And that's why I did not really put this connection. So this connection from this atom remains basically unattended. From the boron side, there is nothing. Well, they call it a hole, basically. So instead of extra electron, which is negatively charged, in case we add phosphorus. <coughs> we, had, we have an absence of an electron, or again, it's called a hole. Well, uh, and, and what happens with this hole? Basically, it plays the role of positively charged um, particle, and it's also um, wandering around, it's floating, because for instance, this electron becomes unbonded, so it can jump to here, and uh, that actually has extra electron in, in the boron, but extra hole here. <coughs> and then this hole can be filled from, let's say, this electron, and the hole will go here. So as soon as we have one missing electron, which is basically not connected, wi wi which really makes a hole in the covalent connection. This hole can wander, can wander around, can float around, because um, in its place some other electron can actually jump. So, in this case we have a different type of uh, uh, kind of an interesting uh, material. It basically resembles metal, but not in, an, in a negative part, negative sense, but in a positive sense, because this hole actually means absence of electrons, and the hole is floating around. The whole thing still, again, is uh, electrically neutral, but there are positive holes floating around, and that's why it's called p-type. Positive. <coughs> so, now we have not just the silicon, which is electrically neutral and, and stable without anything um, floating around inside. We have two kinds of semiconductors. We have a p-type semiconductor, which is silicon with some kind of impurity embedded in it, atoms of boron, and some others, not, not, not only boron, some others as, as, as well can be... Can be Added to, to introduce the same effect. 
Um, and also we have an n-type where extra electrons in both cases in p-type semiconductors and n-type semi semiconductors we have certain particles well in case of a hole it's not really a particle it's an absence of particle but it plays exactly the same role something is floating around and uh, basically introduces some uh, carriers which we can use in some kind of a electrical uh, scheme. And now, obviously, we are approaching how we do this particular thing. What if we will have the n-type semiconductor and connect it to this p-type? N-type has floating negative um, electrons. P-type has floating holes. I will use, you know, plus as a positive thing. Now, what happens next? Well, if they are really close together, I mean really close, like contact, very nice contact, it's basically two um, uh, relatively small disks, let's say, or, or squares of silicon uh, with added impurities. Uh, impurity of producing uh, n-type in one case and impurity produce, producing uh, uh, p-type in another case. And these two plates of silicon are just bonded together somehow. This area now, electrons are floating, basically, right? And, 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 and uh, holes are floating around all the time, by, by themselves. Um, now, what happens in the borderline? Well, in the borderline, it happens a very interesting thing. When an electron approaches here, hole approaches from here, well, electron is a negatively uh, charged particle, hole is absence of this. So there is some kind of an atom here with a missing uh, bond, mo missing link. It, it, it needs bond, it, well, it will bond together, basically. This electron will replace absent link uh, of, um, um, of the atom here. And as I was saying, covalent links are very strong. Uh, uh, they are probably stronger than the relationship between electron and, and nuclei. And that's why this bonding together happens. Now, as soon as we have this type of bonding together, uh, what happens is, this thing used to be electrically neutral, but now this electron comes here, it uh, replaces absent um, link, bond together, but now we have one electron greater on the bottom part and one electron less on the, uh, on the top part. So this diffusion on the, uh, on the border between uh, n-type and p-type causes the whole thing charged with minus here and plus here because the electron comes here, used to be neutral, now it, it has a negative sign. And this one used to be neutral but now it lost the electron, so it becomes positive. So in the immediate neighborhood of this borderline, there is this PN junction, as they're saying, PN junction, where the, uh, the electric charge actually exists. The uh, part of the uh, P-type, which is close to the border, becomes negative, and part of the n-type, which is close to the border, becomes positive. So it's really built up, up to a certain extent, and then when the electricity, negative electricity in the bottom part becomes relatively strong, it prevents electrons from diffusion down, and obviously the whole thing, the whole process stops. However, it stops only after certain electromotive force or voltage has been accumulated between these two plates. Okay, so the electrons which are accumulated in the borderline are probably again can co can probably float around a little bit. Maybe not. Maybe yes. But these are very very thin 
um, uh, plates. So basically, um, doesn't really matter how deep it goes. But what important is that the bottom plate plane plate is actually becomes negative, and the, uh, the the top one, which is n type, becomes positive. And there is certain uh, voltage between them. Not not the big one, really very very small one, but there is one. Now. What happens if we will start exciting electrons on the top? Well, we will increase their energy, and if the layer of negative uh, electrons was sufficient before to prevent other electrons to, to diffuse, with excited electrons, it will probably go a little bit deeper. And the more excitement we will introduce into electrons above, the uh, the bigger difference in in the potential electric potential between top and bottom plates will be the more voltage will be uh, really observed and finally if we will connect them with a wire with some kind of a load or whatever what happens then well the accumulated electricity negative electricity here will go back here and it will basically compensate this plus. But then, again, it diminishes the negative potential of the bottom part, and the diffusion again can start. So if we just have this particular thing, we will have electricity circulating. Now, if we will introduce the heat or sunlight or whatever else which excites from the top, from the n-type, we will have a more intense electricity. And the more excited electrons are, the more intense diffusion will be there, and therefore the more voltage we will observe on, on this battery. Basically, that's the principle. As long as we have two different n-types and p-types types, uh, semiconductor connected to each other, we will have we will have this electricity flowing from from this to this El but not electricity electrons will flow from here to here the flow of, el of electricity for whatever reasons is is from positive to negative so it's opposite to electrons and so it will be the arrow will be here um, okay so this is the main principle now how do we actually um, make it? Well, again, again, as I was saying, we have two different silicon plates, one with introduced impurity, which makes it n-type, another introduced impurity, which makes it p-type, let's say um, uh, phosphorus and, uh, and, and boron. What, uh, and, uh, and then, if we will introduce sunlight uh, as, an, as, as an exciting factor for electrons, well, then we will have basically the electricity. Now, in, in practice, usually there are uh, not very big ones, uh, these uh, silicon uh, plates, but then you can connect them in series, one after another after another, which will increase their um, combined voltage. So usually they are making, let's say, squares, something like this, and they combine certain number of squares into big um, uh, flat surface, um, which is basically called solar panels. And then you introduce basically a certain number of solar panels, you put it on a roof or whatever, and they will produce certain uh, electricity. Now, I did not discuss any technical aspects. How do we connect it to, to the uh, electrical grid, to any kind of devices, etc. Um, uh, deliberately, this is not the purpose of the lecture. The purpose of the lecture is to explain this particular principle, the PN junction and its role in um, creating the electricity. And this PN junction mechanism is used like everywhere, uh, wherever we see electronics, in in all the televisions, computers, etc., etc. 
it's all built on this principle. That's why it's very important to understand it. I'll probably talk about this more whenever I will talk about electronics and semiconductors, but I just wanted to, and I'll probably repeat more or less what I just said, but in this particular case, this structure, the structure of the atoms uh, of silicon with certain impurities and the pH and the PN uh, junction, uh, that's something which you have to really remember and uh, understand. That's it for today. Thank you very much and uh, good luck. By the way, I do suggest you to read on the unisor.com. I do suggest you to read the notes for this lecture and uh, look at the nice pictures much, much better than whatever I put here. Okay, take care. Thank you.